Good to see all of you here. Good morning. Just uh, real quick, do we have anybody here, and this is your first time with us, this is your first time visiting our church, anybody? Hi, welcome, good to have you here. Um, man, this is, this is like back a few Sunday over here. There's a lot of you. Who's the first welcome, one here? Welcome, welcome. Um, Pastor Gary, I think you had a couple of announcements you wanted to highlight for us this morning. I do. I have a couple of phrases. If I can at this point, I did have some praise for my family sitting up there, part of my family, my daughter, and son in law, and their, their whole tribe. I tried. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> then, is, is this surprise to the best, though? Lucas and his wife Kathy showed up. And I had the privilege of marrying them back in October of what, 22? Of oh, 22? She's pregnant. Okay. And you're still sitting together and holding hands and everything? Yeah. All right, well, that's good. <laughs> so we're all excited for her for them. That'll be their first baby. And then our grandson, Josh, who has four of our great granddaughters, we have my great granddaughters and my great grandson. He called about an hour after Daniel called, so they just had their baby, which is number nine. Uh, and Josh just told us that his wife is pregnant, so we're going to have another great grandson. I know I confused everybody. <laughs> next week. Yes, next week, next week, next Sunday. Next Sunday. After church, there will be a meeting of the congregation, the members, but we're inviting anybody else that would like to join us. Uh, Jesse is sitting up there with his wife, Elizabeth. Jesse's going to speak. And if you haven't met Jesse and his wife and family, uh, try to say hi to them after the service. Uh, he's the candidate that was chosen by the committee uh, after an extensive search. And you'll have an opportunity to ask him questions and to hear his vision and to, to vote on that position and that plan. Uh, also next week, communion. We'll have communion. Uh, normally we have it the first Sunday, but uh, we moved it for a couple of different reasons. And then on Saturday the 20th, the men's breakfast is at 8 o'clock, and the women's fellowship is at the church here at 10. Uh, if you're in the valley, join us. For those two events, a uh, couple other things in May, Esther Strait will be here on the 5th of, uh, of May, that Sunday, and on the 3rd Sunday, the Love for Event will be here, so we have a couple of musical events planned for that month. And then, you may be aware of this, uh, there's a young girl, that Steve and Karen, Esther Steve and Karen, are going to be running in the marathon for. Uh, she's a, a young girl that is just crippled. I'll put it that way. Yeah. Uh, her feet, instead of running this way, they they just are all bent. And they're running to raise money, and they've already had promises of quite a, quite a bit of money. But they're running in the marathon out of Pittsburgh to raise money for this girl. Her name is Treasure. And we're supporting that effort in church. If you want to give to that effort for her surgeries and all, all that she's going to need to get back to normal, uh, you can give a love offering. You can do it back here after the service, put it in the basket, or you can write a check and just put love offering to treasure, and that, that will get to that uh, where it needs to go. Okay. I think that's it, Jim. All right. All right. Um, the prelude time is a time for us to just start focusing our attention. We come here every Sunday um, from a week where we've been a lot of places, done a lot of things. Um, there's a sense in which Sunday morning is a reminder to us of who we are and who we belong to. And it takes a little mental exercise to do this. Um, so 
let's prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. And I'm going to ask you guys also, if this thing echoes too much, because I'm hearing a little bit of an echo right now, if it's too much, like raise your hand and let us know and we'll adjust the volume. We're kind of playing with this as we go along. So, oh, you've already adjusted it. This sounds better already. Okay, thank you. Anyway, let's prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. Turn to number 19. That's going to be our call to worship this morning. Number 19. Oh, and I need to tell you in advance also, um, our regular organist and our pianist are not here with us this morning. Kathy has volunteered to pinch hit. Mark has a much better singing voice than what I will ever have. But I need you to sing today. Okay, we got to carry this thing without our usual musician, musicians, and I'm sure that you can do that. Call to worship, save me his praise, number 19. I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. You are my God. And I will praise you. You are my God. And I will exalt you. I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. Father, we're here, and we would ask that the words of our mouths and meditations of our hearts would be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. By your spirit, meet, meet with each one of us today. Speak to us that word that we need to hear most. And may we be both receptive and responsive to it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our first hymn is um, a hymn that I hope most of you, are, I'm hoping that for all the hymns, that um, I hope most of you are uh, familiar with. It's number 65, Stand Up and Bless the Lord. It is a very um, simple, singable tune, so I'm going to ask, let's stand together. Stand up and bless the Lord. Stand up and bless the Lord. Amen. Uh -huh. 
Let's continue our worship by giving to the work of God's kingdom. I'm going to ask our ushers to go forward at this time. Father, we give you thanks for the opportunity and the privilege of being part of your kingdom and being able to serve you in the work of your kingdom. We ask that you would bless both gift and giver and that you would use both for the furtherance of your kingdom here on earth. Amen. I'm just so thankful we have our family here with us to spend time together for this weekend. It's just a, a blessing so much from the Lord. Yeah. Anyone else? 
Yeah. I would just like to thank the Lord for his goodness to our family as we've gone through some uh, troubles with our health lately, but I know that uh, you folks have been praying for us up here, so thank you for that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes, prayer for Barb Palkey. She is in the hospital. Um, she has two broken ribs and some other problems right now. story of building a car, sort of a combination hot rod, dune buggy, all, you know, all-terrain thing. Dragster. Tractor. Dragster. I mean, it, your dragster. It, I mean, just really souped up machine. And on his test drive, it went out of control. son was killed and the father was put in the hospital and they didn't think he was going to make it. He has since come around. Um, I still don't think they have a, fil a firm idea as to what exactly happened. They're still trying to reconstruct things but right now is immense and um, even though the family is, is very much made up of believers in Christ the pain is, is beyond words um, you need to understand this when Paul wrote about this, he said, I want you to, I do not want you to sorrow or grieve in despair. He doesn't say, I don't want you to sorrow. He doesn't say, I don't want you to sorrow or grieve. Okay? 
You're going to say that. He says, I don't want you to grieve in despair like those who have no hope. It still hurts a lot. There are times in life where all we can do is just put our hand in the hand of Jesus and hang on tight and trust him to get us through. And this is one of those times, I think. So let's look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you today acknowledging our need of you, acknowledging our dependence on you. Lord, there are times and situations where you are the only one who can be to us what we need, and you're the only one who can get us through the hard, painful times. We would remember, especially before you today, the Terry family, and ask, Oh, Father, that you would surround them with family and friends who can be comforting, who can be encouraging, who will know what to say and when to say it and how to say it. Father, we thank you that we're not just a number with you. You know each one of us personally. You know each one of us individually. There's a week before us, and we don't know what all is going to happen this coming week. We suspect from past experience that some of it will be good, some of it not. Some of it will bring smiles, some of it may bring tears. Some things we'll understand and other things we won't. But in all of it, you will be there with us. You've promised to do that and you've never lied about anything. So Father, when we go forward from this place today, May we go forward with a sense of assurance and strength. Maybe still hurting. Maybe still kind of confused about things. But still with assurance and strength that you are with us and you'll get us through. And there's a day coming when you will bring us home. And then there's another day coming when you're going to make everything that's wrong right. Got to admit, we look forward to that day. You know the needs and concerns of our hearts today. We've given you thanks and praise for things like family, for things like new friends for things like a measure of health. We've also expressed needs, people that are undergoing or who will be undergoing various treatments. We want to pray for their stamina, mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. For those who are taking medicine right now, like our friend Steve, we ask that you would use that medicine in a strong, mighty way in their physical bodies to bring about recovery and health. For our friend Barb and the situation that she's in and moving through, and we ask this also for ourselves, 
that you would just reassure us that you're always with us, no matter what. We're thankful most of all today for the gift of salvation in Jesus. We're thankful that because of him, we could be forgiven, become your children, be reconciled with you. You didn't have to do it, but you did. And we thank you. Forgive us of our many sins, but don't stop there. Make us more like Jesus. It's in his name that we pray all of these things. Amen. If you, uh, if you want to read with me the scripture reading this morning, it is 1 Samuel chapter 3, starting with verse 1. First Samuel 3, starting with verse 1. Now the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. And in those days the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, he was lying down in his usual place. The Lamb of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. And the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli, and he said, Here I am, you called me. Eli said, No, I did not call. Go back and lay down. So he went back and he laid down. And again the Lord called, Samuel. Samuel got up, he went to Eli, here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call, go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord in a personal way. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. <coughs> the Lord called Samuel a third time. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. And Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. And so he said to Samuel, Go back and lie down. If he calls you again, say, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood there, calling out like he did other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said this to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears of it tingle. At that time, I'm going to carry out against Eli everything that I spoke against his family from beginning to end. I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons made themselves contemptible, but he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Samuel lay back down until morning, and then he opened up the doors of the house of the Lord. Now, he was afraid to tell Eli the vision that he had. Eli called him. And he said to him, Samuel, here I am, Samuel said. What was it he said to you? Now there must have been a pause right here that the text doesn't tell us about. Samuel didn't answer right away. Because the next thing out of Eli goes like this. Do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything that he told you. So Samuel told him everything, everything, hiding nothing from Eli. And then Eli said, 
He is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of his words fall to the ground. And all of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. Okay. I'd like to speak today about hearing God's voice in our lives. And specifically, I'd like us to be thinking along the lines of what's needed? What kind of things are needed in order for us to hear God's voice? Now, for some of you, this may be new. For others, it's going to be more of a, more of a refresher kind of thing. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. You all know, well, most 90 plus percent of you, you know that verse. Okay, one of the things I understand from that verse is this. The Lord wants to speak to us. Okay? My sheep hear my voice, and they, and they follow me. I believe that. I believe the Lord wants to speak to us. I want you to believe that today, that the Lord wants to speak to you. So let's just start right there, that the Lord wants to speak to each of us. Now let me set this up. In the town in which I live, I go to a men's breakfast and Bible study at one of the local churches. And a while ago, we were looking at this subject of hearing God when he speaks. And we got to discussing it, and some good things came out of that discussion. Let me share with you some of the preliminary things that were shared. First thing is this. All of us agree that it is hard to hear God's voice. It's a hard thing. And some of the reasons that were mentioned for that were as follows. First of all, because there are so many things clamoring for our attention and our time and our energy. And they're not all bad things. See, that's part of the problem. They can still crowd God out, but they're, they're good things. Second thing mentioned was because our lives are so filled with commitments and responsibilities and activities. And again, they're not all bad things. Third thing mentioned was, see if you, see if you identify with this, because we are moving so fast throughout the course of any given week to get to everything that we think needs to be gotten to. How many of you measure time now, the days, how many of you measure time now in terms of weeks instead of just days? Yeah, I see some smiles out there. You know who you are. So in the midst of this discussion, one of the things that we're getting at is this. It's hard to hear God's voice. In fact, some of the guys were saying, truth, this seems out of reach. This seems out of reach to me to hear God's voice with all that I got going. It seems, I don't know, kind of unrealistic. Okay. I'm going to put you on the spot this morning. Okay? And the longer I'm going to put, let me put it this way. The longer you pause, the longer this sermon will be. Okay? What that means is this. I want you to interact with me. Here's the question that I want you to answer. What kind of things make it hard to hear God's voice? Think about it. What kind of things, what kind of obstacles make it hard to hear God's voice? Give me some examples. Go. Telephone. Again? Telephone. Telephone. Okay. Just busy, busy, busy with the busy, list of busy, things busy, we have yeah. to do each day. Entertainment. Entertainment. Yeah. Not being in the Word. 
Not being in the Word. Yeah. I guess we, I mean, you know, maybe we could talk about a lack of discipline in terms of having a time when that happens. Okay. Anyone else? Work schedule. Work schedules. Yes. <laughs> Other ideas? Cell phones. Cell phones. Yes. Yeah. In the scripture reading here, we're given some ideas for what's needed in terms of what's needed for us to hear God's voice in our lives. I want to go through them with you. First thing is this. In order to hear God's voice, we need to have or we need to create an environment that lends itself to that, okay, or that favors that kind of thing happening. In other words, we need a time and a place that lends itself to what happened here in the story, to being quiet and still and listening. Now, we've talked about this before in other sermons and in our Sunday school lesson as well. Being quiet and still and listening before God is hard for us as Americans. And I say as Americans because we've got things like cell phones and all kinds of media where it is amazingly easy to have our time eaten up with those things. This is one of the dangers of being in America. You know, in, in countries where those things like, you know, cell phones don't exist, there's not much in the way of TV, they might have a radio, but... You know what else they, you know what they have that we don't have? Time. Time to be still and quiet before God and focus. So the first thing is this. In order to hear God's voice, we need to have or we need to make an environment that lends itself to that kind of thing happening. Now when the Lord spoke to Samuel here in the story, it was in a quiet place and a quiet time. And I think that's a big lesson for us here. We can't be in an, in an environment of noise and movement all the time and expect to hear from God clearly, okay? We've got to get away from the noise and the distractions and the clutter. Even though, as I said, some of the clutter that we have in our lives may be good things. You may have heard this saying, sometimes the good is the enemy of the best. Well, that may, that may well be true here. we got to get away from those things that distract us. Because if we don't, if we don't separate ourselves from time to time from all the other voices, we're liable to miss hearing the one voice that should matter the most to us. One author put it this way, and I'm not a poet, this guy is better, much better than me, he put it into rhyme. The quiet times we spend with God in solitude and prayer will strengthen and restore our souls and help us sense his care. That whole idea of being quiet and still before God meditating on him. An author by the name of James Hamilton writes the following about hearing God's voice. And I'm just old enough that I remember these things. It wasn't used, it wasn't in use when I was a kid, but I remember seeing it and I remember my father and my grandfather telling me about it. Listen to the story. Before refrigerators, I know I'm stretching some of your imaginations right now, before refrigerators, people used ice houses to preserve their food. Ice houses were big buildings, they had really thick walls, no windows, and a tightly fitted door. What would happen was this, in the winter when streams and lakes were frozen, large, and I mean large, like fill this room large, large blocks of ice were cut, they were hauled into the ice houses, and they were covered with sawdust. And I'm not making this up. It was not uncommon for the ice to last until midsummer. That's how well these things were, were sealed. 
Well, at one ice house, one man lost a valuable watch while he was working in the house. He searched diligently for it, carefully raking through the sawdust, but he couldn't find it. His fellow workers also looked, but their efforts also proved futile. A small boy who heard about the fruitless search slipped into the ice house during the noon hour, and pretty soon he came out with the watch. The men were amazed, and they asked him, how did you find it? I closed the door, the boy said. I closed the door, I laid down in the sawdust, and I kept very still. And soon I heard the watch ticking. I think this is true for us also. In order to hear God's voice, we need to have or create an environment that favors hearing from Him. A time, a place that lends itself to being quiet and still and listening. Now look, what I'm saying right now may sound really simple. It may sound really obvious. But it's also maybe something that's not very easy for us to do because of the things that we've mentioned. So that's the first thing. Second thing is this. In order to hear God's voice in our lives, we need to have, I'm going to call this, a discerning ear. Couldn't think of another way to put it. Um, maybe a discerning heart would be a, more, a better way to put it. What I'm saying is this, we need to be able to pick God's voice out from all the other voices that we hear during the course of a day or a given week. Now, here again, this may not be easy, because we've got a lot of voices clamoring for our attention, and then every single one of them saying, I'm urgent, I'm urgent too, you're not as urgent as me, yes I am. And it goes on and on like that. I'm urgent. I'm, you know, you must deal with me first. <sighs> not an easy thing. You know what else complicates it? God is not the only source of the thoughts and feelings that come into our heads and into our hearts. <clears throat> thoughts and feelings can be self-generated. I mean, let's face it, we all know this, I think. You can talk yourself into a bad mood. You can't. And you will feel bad. And you can talk yourself into a good mood. And you may not be completely cured of your bad mood, but you might be somewhat bearable for other people to be around. <laughs> well, in the same way, not every thought that you and I have comes from the Lord. Some of the stuff that we have is self-generated. And also, I do believe that there is a personal being called Satan, the enemy of our souls. And sometimes I think he injects these nasty, nagging thoughts and doubts into our minds. So this is something where we've got to be very, very careful. We need to have a discerning ear or a discerning heart. Now, Um, this is not original to me, okay? I, this has been around for years and years and years, decades. And I don't know the original source, but I want to give you four ideas for developing what I'm calling this discerning heart, this discerning ear. Four ideas for helping you discern whether what you are quote-unquote hearing is coming from God or not. First of all, we've always got to compare what we think we're hearing with scripture, okay, with scripture. Now I've given you this principle before, but it bears repeating. The spirit of God will never go against the word of God, all right? The spirit of God will never go against the word of God. God's word comes first. And when we start having different ideas about things, it's really, really important for us to compare what this idea is with Scripture, because Scripture is the measuring stick or the standard by which other ideas are tested and evaluated. So that's the first guideline. Second thing is this, the whole idea of history. 
and I'm talking Christian history here, comparing what we think God is saying now with the witness of the Christian church throughout the ages, throughout the centuries. In other words, I'm asking myself the question, are there any insights from the Christians who have gone before me in church history that can help me understand and decide about what I'm facing in the here and now? What does Christian history tell me? What can I learn from the Christians who have gone before me? What wisdom, what good advice can I get from them and their witness? This is, this is something that a lot of times I think people overlook. A third thing, and this, here again, this is simple, but I, I, you might be surprised at how many people don't in, in, employ it. The whole idea of reason, reason, rational thinking. Dawson Trotton, founder of the Navigators, an organization that many of you have heard of, said this, you know, God gave you an awful lot of guidance when he gave you a brain. I like that. God expects us to use the rational facilities that he's blessed us with, rational thinking processes. And I would add to that also rational interpretation methodology when it comes to scripture and also when it comes to evaluating our circumstances. A fourth guideline for determining God's voice is it has to do with personal experience and personal insights as well. Now, I want to break this down a little bit. There's two aspects to this. First of all, what are the insights and the experiences of the brothers and sisters in Christ that I have around me right now in the present? What are the insights and experience of the brothers and sisters that I am currently in relationship with? And I say that this is important because of this. You and I, when we were called to faith, when we were called to Christ, we were also called to be part of Christ's community, Christ's fellowship, the church. We were created to relate to and with each other. And to be quite plain about it, it is just plain conceited and immature on our part to think, that we don't need to be connected with other believers in order to live the Christian life. Okay? That's just conceited. That's just foolishness. I've met people like this, though. Well, all I need is my Bible and the Holy Spirit, and I'll get along just fine. Look. <sighs> How do I say this? Oh, yeah. You're wrong. God's created you to live in community. It is prideful. It is selfish. It is not biblical for you to think or imagine that you don't need other Christians. And anybody going down that road sooner or later, they're going to make some bad life choices. Possibly whoppers of bad life choices. I've seen that happen. Maybe some of you have too. A positive way of saying it is this, look, together we can discern things that we might miss individually because of our maturity level or our immaturity level, maybe due to a blind spot, maybe due to a character defect, maybe due to some kind of sin in our lives. It's not really all that difficult for us to misinterpret scripture or to miss relevant passage or to miss correctly evaluating my circumstances. But when we are together, there's a better chance of those negative things not happening. Let me give you an example. You may be in a Bible study, okay? And somebody shares a verse or an insight that they have with you that you have not considered before. And them sharing that insight may give you a whole new outlook on that situation that you're involved in. Or it may keep you from making a wrong decision. This is how the body of Christ, the church, is to work. We're not to be in isolation. 
We're to be relating with each other, relating to each other. Why? Because by doing this, we can help keep each other from messing up too badly. Okay? Then there's the whole idea of personal experience in terms of me. Personal insights in terms of what I have. In other words, what sense of leading do I have in terms of what I think God is saying to me? What, what's, what's my sense of God's voice in my life? Okay, now, I want you to notice something here. Very important. Because of my tendency, and we've all got this, because of my own tendency to be self-centered and see things my way and want to do things my way and have things go my way, this one needs to come last from the others, okay? So we've got scripture, history, reason, experience, out of others, and then my own. Four guidelines for helping us determine whether what we are hearing is coming from God. Now, back to the main part of the message. So in order to hear God's voice, we need to have an environment that favors hearing him, we need a discerning ear. Here's one. In order to determine God's voice, I need to have a servant's heart. I need to see myself as his servant. Now, this is really important, and on one hand it's really simple, but on the other hand it's also big. It goes like this. He's the Lord. I'm the servant. He's in charge. I'm not. He directs. I follow. We can't have the attitude that says, well, I'm the person who's in charge of my life. Listen, God rarely speaks to an individual who is that self-centered. I'm not saying he can't, but I'm saying that more often than not, the person with that attitude is very much spiritually deaf. So we've got a conducive environment that favors hearing him. We've got to have a discerning ear. We need to serve his heart. Here's one, and this is true from the story. We need to have times where we are still and quiet and listening for God and not just speaking. Now this, this is going to be convicting for all of us, and I'm including myself with this. If we're honest, we got to admit that most of the time when we go before the Lord, we do all the talking and he does all the listening. Okay? That happens, you know, at least, what, eight, nine times out of ten. There, need, there needs to be times where we're just still and quiet and waiting and listening. <clears throat> Can I ask you something? When's the last time you did that? When you were just still and quiet before God. I'm going to go out on a limb here. It's not much of a limb. But I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that this is probably an area where all of us could use some improvement. So... Environment that favors hearing him, discerning ears, servant's heart, being quiet and still. Five. Here's one, and this goes right back to the story. We need to have an openness and a submissiveness for hard truth. You remember when the word of the Lord came to Samuel? What the word of the Lord was concerning Eli? Eli and his family were going to be cut off. <laughs> God was going to judge them. And God flat out said, I don't care how many sacrifices happen. He's basically saying, you have passed the point of no return. Judgment is coming. Wow. That's a hard thing. So an openness a submissiveness to hard truth. 
You talk about not easy. Sometimes, sometimes though, what God has to say to us is very confrontive or confrontative. I'm not sure which is the right word. For example, it may be that for some of us, God is saying, you know that situation that did not turn out the way you thought it should? You need to give that thing to me. You need to release that thing to me. Or how about this? Maybe God is saying to some of us, you know that hurtful situation where people badmouthed you and, and took actions against you and really, really hurt? You know that situation? You need to give that thing to me. You need to release that situation and those people to me. And you need to start moving and taking the steps of forgiving them so that you don't become a bitter person. Now that's not an easy thing. Those are hard words from God, but you know what? I don't know about you, but I've met people who need to hear those words, and I've been that person myself from time to time. I want you to believe today that God wants to speak and that he wants to speak to you. I believe that he wants to speak, but we need to be ready, and we need to be willing, we need to be prepared, we need to take the necessary steps, we need to have this, this environment that favors or lends itself to hearing him, we need to have that discerning ear, and those four things I mentioned, we need to have a servant's heart, and we need to be still before God, and we need to be open, just in case God has something hard, confronting to say to us. Let's pray. Father, this passage of Scripture has some, on the one hand, they're good lessons. On the other hand, they're not easy lessons. This can be hard. Lord, I... I pray for all of us this morning that it would be the desire of our heart to know you better, to relate better with you, to relate better with our brothers and sisters, to, to develop these things that we've talked about today, this, especially just the whole idea of having a time and a place that lends itself to our hearing from you. To, to have that discerning ear. Lord, we want that. We want to be able to sort your voice out from all the other voices. That we need a servant's heart. And we need to build those times of stillness and quietness into our lives. Help us. Help us. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Kathy, I'm going to ask you in part to come our closing hymn. <coughs> you are right with oh, that? Okay. If you would please take your hymnals and turn to number 676. A uh, very familiar hymn to, I think, most of us. 676. Oh, Jesus. No number on the board. So just go ahead that number. Okay. 676, oh Jesus, I have promised. Let's stand together.